Welcome to the Executive Compensation Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Harvey. On this episode, I'm joined by Dan Kaufman and Virginia Rhodes. Dan and Virginia are partners at Meridian, and they both work out of our Atlanta office. Dan, Virginia, welcome to the podcast. Morning, Ryan. Good morning. So today we're going to talk uh, about compensation implications of a CEO transition. Uh, Boards of directors have many duties, but few duties are as important or have as much potential impact on shareholder value as a CEO transition. Sometimes a transition is very well planned with a new CEO candidate waiting in the wings, and sometimes it can strike like lightning out of a blue sky. But in either case, getting the compensation issues right is critical for any board. So I want to start our discussion with how companies can be more planful in a transition. Uh, Dan, what are some of the compensation actions that companies should be taking well in advance to plan for the eventual transition of their CEO? No, Ryan, it's a great question. And as you said, it's it's uh, extremely important for boards to, to be thinking about this. It's one of their, their most important roles is to, to manage the CEO and, and that transition. I think as part of that, one of the biggest things is really run succession planning. Um, while not directly tied to compensation, it, it does have a, a lot of ties to it, but it's making sure you have that planned action, whether it's at the committee or the board or both um, levels, and having the planned succession both for emergency as well as long term, thinking about who those candidates are, setting them up appropriately from a uh, you know from a performance plan and development plan and and figuring out who the next candidates are going to be. And then that ties into compensation directly when you think about how you pay those individuals. Uh, there may be additional equity awards, there may be special promotional awards uh, in the future. There may be moving them closer over time to what a CEO pay may be uh, rather than waiting. And really all of those are unique situations that depend on each of the companies um, from a succession plan. Uh, The other thing from a pure compensation plan to think about are are really a couple of things. One is your severance plan, you know, making sure you have a competitive severance plan, you know, that those individuals who may be in the pipeline uh, and concerned whether they may get the job or not get the job are feel protected that even in the case where they don't, they're gonna be treated appropriately and fairly and have a severance plan. So making sure you've thought through and benchmarked your severance plan and it fits your situation uh, from, you know, from a without cause or or good reason termination, for example, uh, as well as retirement provisions. One of the things that can really cause uh, transitions to go awry is when your retirement provisions aren't aligned appropriately. So for example, if you're, if your equity or even your cash severance uh, in this case is more valuable in the case of a termination uh, without cause or good reason, uh, it may be challenging to get an individual to retire when it's best for the company uh, and for that individual to to step aside. So thinking about uh, making sure that your retirement provisions are either set in your plans appropriately or through employment agreements, or there's at least some understanding of how that's going to be handled and you have a history of how that's handled by the board to not create a, a barrier for an individual to, to depart uh, when it's appropriate. Um, and then the final thing I'll mention, uh, which I think is a good governance item for a number of reasons, but can really help in this situation are tally sheets. Uh, having the board and the committee know what each individual would be due under different termination scenarios, I think is important. What you don't want is a surprise at the end where a CEO is departing, the board makes the decision that that's the right choice. And then all of a sudden there's a severance plan that is a gotcha that that makes the headlines and, and no one's aware of. So uh, so I think being aware of your programs, benchmarking them and you know having those tally sheets to really understand uh, where individuals are and, and the different scenarios are, are all important. Yep. Yep. No, I've definitely seen, uh, particularly retirement arrangements, trip companies up um, and, and and create issues when it, when it comes time for a transition. Virginia, anything you would add to, uh, to Dan's comments? Yeah, j- just a few additional points that might be useful. Um, one thing to remember is this is an ongoing process. So it's not like the, the board goes through this exercise once, sets a plan in place and never revisits it. It's really important to continue to evolve the succession plan over time. Things will change. The tenure of the current CEO will change. The individuals that are coming up behind him or her 
um, may, may evolve over time. So it's important to reassess this on an annual basis. And then secondly, as, as Dan mentioned, to make sure that the visibility in that next layer down uh, comes up to the board level, whether that's through bringing folks to, to board meetings, giving them roles uh, in, in various topics, whether it's having them come to dinners, uh, you know, once a quarter, so that once that succession plan becomes more imminent, that folks aren't uh, new to the board. So th- those two additional points might be useful. Yep, yep. No, that's uh, that, that's very insightful. So uh, love to be planful, obviously, and and that's what we're striving for. But unfortunately, things do not always play out according to, the, to our plans, and um, very often CEO departures happen unexpectedly. Uh, Maybe business conditions change and the board uh, determines that they need to have a change in CEOs or possibly the CEO might be lured away to another company or may have health issues. So uh, we do see unexpected departures uh, more often than we would like. And so, Virginia, what what are some of the best practices you've seen for dealing with uh, an unexpected transition? Yeah, Ryan, it's never a good good spot to be in. And and hopefully, if organizations are planful about their process, they'll be a little more organized around it if it does occur. Um, a few helpful tent, uh, a few helpful tips. One is make sure that the the board understands who the point person will be to uh, determine the process. So usually, you'll find either the the chairman of the board, if that's an external uh, individ- independent individual, it might be someone on the nominated governments committee. Certainly, that uh, point person would be liaising with the compensation committee when it comes to determining pay packages. But knowing who that point person is in advance, so you're not scrambling at the last minute. The second thing that's important is to determine in advance what are the critical skills that are needed in this particular situation. Maybe the individual that the the current incumbent has left because of a a transformation or or a change in strategy. Maybe there's a performance-related issue. Maybe the organization is struggling. So what is the critical skill or skills that are needed uh, for the person filling this new role? And I think most importantly, what we see often in these circumstances is rather than rush to try to fill a permanent slot, um, consider an interim role, whether it be someone that's on the board currently that that can fill this spot that does have those critical skills that are needed, or possibly a, a sitting management team member. Maybe there's a president or COO position that can fill this on a temporary basis. We've even seen CFO roles that uh, can fill this slot recognizing that as they take on more responsibilities, you may have to backfill some of their own responsibilities. In terms of regardless of whether it's a a board member that fills that potential interim role or a sitting management member, there are certainly compensation implications that need to be considered. Um, If it's a board member, usually what we see is kind of a, a two to eight month period You might have just a cash compensation, Uh, you know, maybe it's a salary on a prorated basis. You also might see an equity grant to tie that individual's interest into the success of the company, particularly over the shorter term. Usually, if it's an equity grant, you might have shorter vesting schedules. There may be some performance contingencies, but it's really to, to tie the interest of that individual to the success of the organization. Same for if there's a a management team member that's stepping up and filling this role on an interim basis, you might have a one-off type of arrangement that is easily removed should that individual go back to his or her current role. Lastly, having a communication plan in place, both internally and externally, um, is important. And these are things that can be thought out in advance. So what are you going to message to your shareholders? What's the um, you know, will there be a duration that's that's put forth um, from an external standpoint? And then even more importantly, frankly, what will you tell your, your employees? What's the plan? Um, you know, how do you envision this role being, uh, you know, if it's a temporary role, how do you envision it uh, transitioning to a more permanent placement? And lastly, uh, for the individual who fills this role, usually part of their role is to determine and to help identify a permanent successor. Now, sometimes we do see the interim becoming the permanent. Um, we've seen that in a few cases recently where a board member steps into that role and then you realize that, uh, you know, you had a permanent candidate all along. But um, in other cases, you're, you're looking externally, 
You're trying to determine internally if you do have any ready now candidates that maybe just needed eight to 12 months um, before they got to that point. But understanding that uh, that timeline, I think, is helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, to probe a little bit more on that. So in a, in a case like that, where you do have an interim, a kind of a surprise interim, um, are investors and, and maybe even more particularly the proxy advisors generally understanding of of those compensation structures or are there any any particular issues we should be concerned about uh, from an external perspective? Yeah, it's, it's a great point. Um, you know, usually what we see is kind of close contact with your shareholders following a situation like this, first of all, to let them know that, you know, you do have a plan, that there is a process in place, um, and that you have been thoughtful about it. Now, of course, when anytime you have a unique compensation arrangement, whether there, whether it be a, a one-time grant or um, some form of equity that, you know, may not have as much performance contingencies or as long of a time span as as you might typically see, it's important to um, engage with your shareholders, to, again, to, to bring them along on your journey, to, to let them um, be a part of the process. Um, disclosure is always critical, not only from the initial you know, 8K disclosure that describes uh, what the compensation arrangements might look like, um, but also certainly in your proxy, and it, and it can be messy. Um, yeah. Usually when there's a CEO transition, you're going to have lots to talk about. Um, so it's important to disclose rationale. To the extent you can talk about duration, it's always helpful, but oftentimes you're, you're, not, you're unable to because you may not know how long this individual will be in an interim role. But um, to the extent you're able to provide um, performance links in the awards that you're you're granting, if it's equity, that's always useful. Um, you know, sometimes you'll see uh, you know softer objectives like um, you know successfully transitioning to a new permanent uh, CEO or helping with that transition or identifying those candidates. So it may not be uh, financially focused like we see often in long term plans, but it may be more shorter term in nature. Yeah. Yeah. So Dan, I, I want to transition maybe to a little more specificity around the the process itself. Once we once we're ready to replace the CEO with a permanent candidate, and I, I know there's a fair amount of overlap um, between internal and external candidates, but there's also I think a lot of differences. So maybe let's start with um, an internal candidate. Uh, can you walk us through some of the compensation considerations related to an internal promotion to CEO? Sure, happy to. And, and I think you're right. There's a lot of overlap and, and a lot of even overlap with uh, some of the things that Virginia mentioned in, in terms of uh, interim roles and and uh, if that interim person stepping in versus even if that interim person doesn't uh, doesn't take on the role and you have to remove a stipend or, or whatever that that pay is. But, you know, many times there's a horse race, right? There's not one specific candidate, although there could be, but there's multiple uh, and I think there's a different challenges in the case where you may have two or more individuals who think they're candidates internally versus uh, the one clear successor that's been planned, right? In the case of a clear successor, uh, you, that individual knows likely that they're going to be getting the role, assuming that the board's gone through their due diligence and, and looked internally, externally. Uh, and then it's really just about what the compensation package is. Uh, presumably, they're new to the role. Right, they're they're being promoted from a from a non CEO role internally. Therefore, it's a step up function for them. You wouldn't expect them to be fully at market or to where the prior CEO was in year one. You could think of it as more of a two to three year transition, assuming performance to market. Uh, so, you know, moving their compensation towards what a CEO pay would be, which is generally a significant jump from from the prior role, uh, and doing it over a multi year period. Uh, you also may, depending on the time of the year, uh, you need to think about the equity award, right? If this is near the beginning of the year, maybe it's adding them to the normal equity program, making up for what would have been a CEO grant, uh, performance-based uh, op, you know, options, RSUs, whatever the mix may be, uh, that would make sense. Uh, however, if you're later in the year, you may choose just to do a promotional grant that's time-based or something that's slightly different. What you don't want uh, generally, is a new candidate CEO having their own performance-based criteria, which is different than the rest of the management team. So all of a sudden, you're in November, you promote someone, and you create a new financial performance plan that's just tied to that one individual. 
uh, it can create disconnects with what they're motivated and what they're thinking through versus the rest of the team. Uh, so unless you're planning on doing that more broadly, uh, generally, if you're later in the year, it's, it's get them to the next annual grant, do something, uh, if anything, at that point uh, to move them up uh, to or move that individual up to the, the, the CEO level. Uh, in the case where you have multiple candidates, I think for the individual who ultimately wins, it's very similar. Right. How do you set their pay? What's over time? I think where it gets more challenging is how do you retain that individual who thought they were in uh, in position and ultimately do, don't doesn't get the role. Uh, and that could be they were told by the former CEO something incorrect. They thought they maybe were uh, more likely or maybe it truly was just a, a two person or a three person race. Uh, and I think you need to think about the transition time for those individuals. Uh, do you want to keep them long term? Are they likely to stay in their current role? And if so, is a retention uh, to keep them there while the new CEO, depending on their relationship with that individual? Uh, or is it that, you know, you know that if they did not get that role, that individual is going to look for a role elsewhere, but they're critical to the transition. So maybe it's a six month, nine month, uh, or, or slightly longer period. Uh, and whether it's cash or additional equity, something to tie them and allow the, the new individual in the CEO seat to evaluate the team and build their structure. Uh, both for that individual who didn't get the CEO role, but also, honestly, for also the broader team. Um, anytime you have transition, uh, you're trying to keep, keep it as stable as possible for at least a period of time for that new person uh, in the seat to, to evaluate the team. Uh, one question I sometimes get, you know, how, how often do you see um, a CEO, an internal candidate that's being promoted into CEO get some sort of a special award? Uh, at the time of being promoted, whether it be, you know, time-based or performance-based, or or is it more co common just simply to see them roll into, obviously, a, a larger compensation package as CEO, but no, you know, no out, you know, un unusual awards or special awards that are related to the promotion. Do you do you see special awards like that? And if you do, are there are there times where they might be more appropriate than others or? Yeah, it's a great question. I don't think there's a right answer. I think it, it's really circumstantial based upon the situation. So I think you do see special awards for new CEOs. Um, and you know, a lot of times it's to create that ownership that they may not have, especially if they're newer to the organization. So maybe they are mm -hmm. brought in a year earlier as part of the succession plan or, or a couple of years in, in order to build that. And maybe they don't have the ownership that you would want uh, and you're trying to create that. Or maybe, um, as Virginia has mentioned earlier, or you, maybe you mentioned, Ryan, this is not planned great we're going to do this over a 10-year period and we know who the candidate is but this is performance isn't there it's time to make a change we need to motivate this team to make a strategic change and do something different well creating a plan for that individual and potentially for the rest of the team uh, to align with that new strategic direction uh, may make sense right this is not a let's just keep rowing in the same direction but we need to make a shift and let's motivate the team to make that change and and if that means the special award with different performance criteria uh, that may make sense. And I think you can tell the story around that uh, much easier than, you know, nothing's changed, but we're just going to throw out a big grant uh, yeah. for that individual. Yeah. And, and just to add to that, one thing that I've seen work well in those circumstances where you do have two individuals and they're internal and they're kind of coming through the ranks and you're not quite sure which one's going to be the best fit. Over time, and again, this is all about being planful. Um, over time, you can also consider should their pay be elevated, you know, above and beyond if you're targeting the median of the market, maybe it's some premium to that. So you're giving them a little bit more on the equity side just to A, continue to have those carrots out there from a retention standpoint. Um, B, you're not having to do that kind of one-time slug of, of equity at a particular time, which we know, you know investors and, and proxy advisors get a bit weary of. And it also um, lets them know uh, that, that they're on the running. You know, certainly you're going to have those conversations with folks at, once you get to a certain point. But just bringing them along on that continuum of um, pay progression that that also would then allow you to not have such a big gap um, once you do uh, you know have that individual candidate that's eventually promoted that can also be a useful tool. Yeah, yeah and I think uh, to that point, one of the fun challenges I think boards have is how do you uh, how do you keep a high performing individual who wants that seat if the CEO is not in an immediate transition timeline. So, you know, if there's a timeline that's one, two, three, five years out, but you're bringing this individual and you're to Virginia's point, you're increasing their compensation. You're doing all the things to say you're, you're next, but how do you keep them when that next is not, not 
immediate. And I think it's all the things that we've talked about. Um, but but ultimately, you know, depending on their age, where they're in the career and their aspirations, uh, you know, you have choices to make. Yeah. Yeah. Well, why don't we let's let's shift to uh, the external candidate. So, you know, we don't always have the internal. I think many companies would prefer to have an internal candidate for a variety of reasons that often doesn't doesn't play out. So what if we have to go outside of the company? Um, Virginia, what are what are some of the best practices you've seen the compensation committees uh, take when they have to pursue an external candidate? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, you know, even if you don't think you need to go outside, sometimes it's a good exercise just to look. So this this doesn't necessarily mean that um, you know there's no good internal candidates if you decide to to go canvas the marketplace. Um, you know, the the first things that that companies do would, would be to determine again identify your point person. Usually, there's a committee, a search committee that's put in place. And by the way. If there is a search committee, oftentimes they will, there will be additional compensation uh, paid to that committee because you do end up meeting uh, more frequently. You end up having to interview candidates. It can take you know quite a long time in some cases. Um, so just uh, be aware of that one particular point. Um, so it's important to, to have folks that are in, involved um, to make sure that you understand what your pay philosophy is. Um, you know, it, it, it's important to um, try to adhere to your current pay philosophy if you're trying to target around median pay for your senior team. Um, usually, it's important to be consistent with that. Now, there are certainly um, unique circumstances that may require you going above and beyond that if you have, you know, the candidate that's been identified. Um, if that person may be already a sitting CEO, which makes it quite difficult uh, to attract uh, someone to, to, a, to a different company. So there are circumstances where you have to go above and beyond. But to the extent you can find someone in the marketplace that is getting that you know, promotional opportunity, um, those often can be uh, you know, um, great candidates to, to include in your pool. So making sure you understand as an organization what you're willing to pay. Um, it's usually important to think about what the current CEO is making. Um, are you going to bring someone in that's you know, kind of right around that same point? Again, if it's a promotional opportunity, you may be able to, to bring someone in a little south of market and bring them up over time. But unfortunately, when you're going outside, it tends to be more expensive. So being prepared for that uh, is important. The, the next thing to recognize is once you've determined kind of what your parameters are that you're willing to pay, when you do start having those conversations with external candidates, it's important to understand that things might change once they come into their seat. Um, even with the internal candidate, there may be folks within the organization that don't fit from a personality or culture standpoint with this new incoming CEO. So identifying that next level that's critical to, to maintain either over the short or long term is important. And this may be where, the, where retention awards are necessary, not for the CEO role, but for that next level down. Um, if you're trying to deliver at an attack team and there, you know there's uncertainty because you're already having to go outside to fill the spot, there may be some spot awards that, that are required to, to keep folks in their seats for a shorter term uh, time period. In lieu of having to do that, however, one thing that I've seen work well is to have over a short period an enhanced severance arrangement for certain individuals. So if you've got a, an executive severance plan and maybe it pays one time space plus bonus to the extent someone is involuntarily terminate, terminated, there might be a short window, a 12 or you know 18 month period where you can enhance the severance arrangement for a certain group. So that if the new CEO comes in place, decides to bring a few team members with him or her that, that they're, um, you know, that they trust, they're used to, then you would provide the outgoing individual, maybe it's one and a half times their regular pay. This might alleviate some of the concerns initially of someone new coming in. It might allow folks to be a little more relaxed in the process. Um, and, you know, it doesn't require you to pay anything unless the, the, the person's involuntarily terminated. So um, it's kind of a nice way to think about something that's a little different than just providing an, uh, a retention grant. And then lastly, um, just again, recognizing when that new individual does come in from the outside, 
there may be um, a need to take a step back from a strategy standpoint. That individual may have different ideas and perspectives about the business. You'll likely want to do a little bit of a, um, a step back from an incentive standpoint. Are there different measures that, that are needed? Is the mix of long-term uh, appropriate? So allowing that individual to have their kind of their own stamp on the programs uh, is really helpful. And, and that's something that happens over time. It's not something that will happen in the first 100 days. But just recognizing the fact that things might look different going forward, I think, is important. Yeah. And I think, you know, just one thing to, to follow up, Virginia, uh, on the difference between what I was talking about is internal versus external. And, and you kind of hinted at this, uh, but probably one of the biggest single items when you bring an external candidate is a buyout of their existing programs. Yeah. Right. You know, you, you can set up compensation competitive and where the old CEO above or below, uh, but where the biggest number that's going to be disclosed is likely buying them out, especially if you're bringing in an experienced CEO from another company. Uh, it's going to be a significant equity ownership situation where you need to buy them out and there's negotiation over their former equity. Are you paying out at a target for the former performance? Are you paying out based upon where they're tracking or, or even something more senior? And again, I think it depends on you know, is this the one candidate? Are you, is it, were they looking to leave or are you recruiting them out of a situation where they're, uh, they weren't looking, right? And, and depending on where you are on the spectrum is how generous you need to be both on a buyout as well as an initial equity award. So it's it's setting both that ongoing comp and in some degree, that's the easier part. It's the it's the one-time awards that that where you see the most negotiation with with the candidate. It, it's a great point, Dan. Um, and it's, it's, I think, you know, to your point, the individual negotiation piece is critical because, you know, as most uh, executives would, they're going to ask for it all. So again, recognizing the willingness and where you are on that continuum to, to whether it's buying out the full award, whether it's, you know, allowing it to vest over the same schedule, whether it's changing the vesting schedule, and then what happens upon uh, certain events, right? So you've got to, make sure that um, those equity award agreements are very tight um, in terms of if within a certain period the you know doesn't work out on either side what happens to those awards because they can be quite costly yeah yeah buyouts can definitely you know get expensive but i my experience has been that you know as long as you're very clear in your disclosures that this is truly a make whole payment we're we're not adding any incremental value but we're trying to keep this person whole I've generally found investors and to a certain extent, proxy advisors are accepting of that. Um, it's really when you start adding above and beyond that, that it can it can start to push the limits. But I've seen some some pretty big numbers that in other circumstances, you might be a little bit cautious about. But if it truly is a make whole um, and that's that's the right candidate, I think investors understand that that's the cost of of bringing someone in. So. It is the cost of doing business, but it's also a reminder that having a really good internal succession plan can not only be helpful for the company, but it can also be the you know, the less expensive route. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And and one thing around that, just Brian, one last thing to think about, and and it's, again, circumstantial is is the amount of shares you need to use for those awards, right? Depending on your share reserves, especially uh, in today's market where share prices are are depreciated. You know, do you have enough shares for those buyouts? Um, there are ways potentially to do inducement awards if you're bringing a CEO in from an external um, place, but there's you know obviously requirements and and things you need to go through from a legal uh, perspective and award agreement and disclosure to do that. Um, but being aware not just of what it requires, but also how many shares uh, it requires within your plan and how do you manage that? And making sure that you understand your limits. Because that, you know, so many omnibus incentive plans still have the, the limitations of how many awards you can provide to individuals in a certain amount of time. Some plans have done away with those when 162M kind of fell, fell off the radar, but a lot of plans still have those limits in place. So be sure you're not running afoul of those limits as you do these larger make whole grants. Yeah, ex excellent point. And I, I love the, uh, idea you threw out, Virginia, of, of maybe enhancing severance, um, for a short period of time, something that, um, I think would would be an interesting concept to consider in, in some of these situations to provide some retention to those key individuals without necessarily locking in the cost of uh, of, of of an actual retention award. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, this has been a great discussion and uh, an important topic. I mean, the average I think the average tenure of a CEO is five and a half years. So, just about every board member out there is going to have to deal with a CEO transition at least once and more than likely more than once in their in their tenure on a board. So 
important topic, something to, uh, to definitely think about. And uh, Dan, Virginia, thanks again for joining the discussion. Thanks, Thanks Ryan. Thanks.